Uh, we're here to help ensure that human rights is not, quote, an orphan issue in global internet policy discussions. Uh, I'm here to make sure we get started on time, so thank you for making sure I don't fail at my one job today. Uh, I'm Gigi Alford with the Global Internet Freedom Program at Freedom House based in Washington, D.C. I want to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists. Uh, Sonia Kelly, to my right, directs Freedom House's Freedom on the Net project. Uh, just this month, her team rolled out the fourth edition of the annual report of net freedoms in 60 countries. Year after year, this report has been a critical tool for all stakeholders to engage in prioritizing, decision making, and advocacy. And uh, this is underscored uh, by the great number of times that I've heard the report referenced in, just the, in the IGF workshops in just the, the first day. Um, we're lucky to have on the, the panel today two authors of country reports, and they represent with, for us uh, civil society and academic communities. Um, to my left, Nigat Zad from Pakistan is Executive Director of Digital Rights Foundation Pakistan. And Buzian Zaid is a Professor of Communications in Morocco. We also have a representative from our host country. Indri is the Executive Director of the Institute for Policy Research and Advocacy. Um, the acronym is ELSAM in Indonesia. And we also have with us from the business community, Ross Le Jeunesse, uh, Global Head of Freedom of Expression and International Relations at Google. Welcome. Uh, unfortunately, our panelist from the Government Multilateral Stakeholder Group wasn't able to make it to the IGF, uh, so we hope that we have representatives from uh, governments in the audience uh, or participating with us uh, via remote participation, uh, and that they'll speak up during this uh, very interactive session. We'll say a little bit more about remote participation when we open up the conversation. But first, I want to turn to Sonia to set the stage for our discussions this morning. Uh, by popular demand, she'll run through an overview of the key findings and new trends from the 2013 analysis. I've actually uh, met a number of people at the IGF who claim uh, to have read all 1,000 pages of the report, uh, which you can find online at freedomhouse.org. Um, but Sonia, for those of us who haven't made it all the way through the full report yet, um, what are the highlights? Thank you very much, Gigi, for this uh, introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, considering that we have a very serious topic at hand, I'm actually going to start with an old Yugoslavian joke. And I'm from uh, the former Yugoslavia, so that's where that comes from. So here you go. A judge walks out of his chamber laughing his head off. He just can't stop laughing to the point that his laughter is vibrating through uh, the court building. And his colleague sees him and says, What's so funny? Tell me. I, I want to laugh as, as well. And he says, well, uh, I just heard the funniest joke ever. It's really the funniest thing I've heard in my last 10 years. And then his colleague says, well, tell me the joke. I can't wait to hear it. And then the judge says, mm, I'm not sure that I can really repeat it. I just gave a guy 10 years in prison for it. So I think this joke, uh, unfortunately, is more relevant today than it was when I heard it some time ago while growing up in the former Yugoslavia. And unfortunately, the reason for it is because we are seeing more and more people arrested for things that they're writing online. And this trend is really becoming so worrisome that not only activists, but actually everyday people who are using Twitter, Facebook, and other social media are affected. As my colleague Gigi mentioned, uh, Freedom House uh, has worked on an annual study of internet freedom, which this year has covered 60 countries. And uh, this study has garnered uh, international attention. And one of the reasons we are here is because we would really like to use it uh, to set up the conversations surrounding human rights on the internet. Um, the study itself is composed of two parts. The first part being uh, reports in every of these 60 countries uh, that we cover. So there is a country chapter for each of them uh, listed in the report in, on our website. But something that Freedom House is really known for is actually that we also grade countries based on their performance of internet freedom. So in addition to these reports, you can actually see how these countries compare to one another. This latest edition of Freedom on the Net uh, focuses particularly on developments uh, between May 2012 and April 2013, 
but some of the more recent developments, such as surveillance, was included because uh, although the revelations happened after the end of our coverage period, it really affected the users during the time that uh, we focused on. Uh, the survey itself uh, is actually being written and uh, researched by 17 researchers, all of whom are based in countries under study. So they're the ones who test availability of websites, they look at legal frameworks, they count the number of users who are being attacked and so forth. More generally, the way how Freedom House assesses the state of internet freedom is through a series of 21 questions and over 100 sub-questions. And then we divide those into three categories. So we look at issues such as obstacles to access. So there we look at uh, infrastructural and economic barriers to access. We look, look at uh, gender barriers. Uh, we look at legal and ownership control over ISPs and so forth. The second category contains uh, a series of questions ranging from uh, content controls, such as blocking and filtering, uh, or uh, takedown notices, intermediary liability, uh, issues such as vibrancy and diversity of online news media, and so forth. And then the third category looks at violations of user rights, including surveillance, attacks against uh, bloggers and online users. It looks at legal frameworks and general law laws that could actually put uh, users behind the bars. So one thing that is really important to us when we create these studies is that we apply the same standards for each country under analysis, so then we're able to come out with uh, a set of uh, evaluations uh, that are methodologically correct. Um, as you can see on our website, and I know that this is uh, too small to read on the screen, uh, but then after we provide our evaluation, we group countries into free, partly free, and not free. And even within each of those categories, there is quite a bit of variation because uh, we score all countries on the scale from 0 to 100, with 0 being best and 100 being the worst score. So uh, even within 31 or 32 on the scale of 100, and then you have countries that earn uh, 55, 56, and 57, which are the countries uh, that are more repressive within this one particular category. Um, one thing that really became uh, apparent to us when we conducted the evaluation this year is that internet freedom is in decline, and this is something that is quite alarming. It has been in decline for the third year straight, and among 60 countries that we examined, 34 have actually registered a negative trajectory. Unlike in the past, where countries uh, that were on downward track were mainly authoritarian states, we've actually seen some quite worrisome trends in uh, some of the uh, world's biggest democracies. So for example, India uh, registered quite significant declines on our scale, and that is for several reasons. Uh, for example, uh, one reason was overblocking during the rioting in northeastern states, as well as increased surveillance uh, and a dramatic increase in the number of people who are being arrested for their posts on social media. The United States declined, obviously, because of surveillance issues, and I think most people in the audience are familiar with that. But another country that has registered significant policy deteriorations is Brazil. One reason for it is just in a dramatic increase in takedown notices uh, surrounding uh, the elections of last year, the municipal elections, uh, as well as an increase in violence against bloggers and online users. In fact, uh, three online news journalists and bloggers will, were killed in Brazil uh, during the coverage period for this report. During our research, we have identified the 10 most common internet controls and uh, it is actually quite diverse how some of these governments are using different tools and different, different methods to control the internet. Uh, probably the number one uh, method that we've seen in our research is blocking and filtering. And out of 60 countries that uh, we evaluated, 29 of them have actually blocked uh, specific content related to politics, religion, or social and political rights. But we've seen a whole range of other tactics, such as restrictive laws, or physical attacks, or cyber attacks against regime critics. For example, when it comes to cyber attacks, we've seen that in 31 out of 60 countries that we examined. Also, take down requests and forced deletions. What we've seen in many countries is that 
uh, governments are actually forcing content providers to take down material that they find offensive, and very often that material is related to the criticism of the authorities or uh, talking about corruption or even environmental pollu pollution. We've also seen an increase in blanket blocks of social media and ICT apps. So we've seen in more and more countries that uh, governments are not only blocking, let's say, an individual Facebook profile or an individual YouTube video, but they're actually choosing to block an entire platform. Uh, what's actually new this year is that more and more governments are actually starting to pay attention to some other ICT tools. So for example, voiceover IP or free messaging services, whether that be Viber or WhatsApp or, uh, or Skype, are actually being increasingly targeted. For some countries, that is because uh, some of these uh, large telecoms are actually afraid for their revenues, so the countries choose to ban them uh, as uh, a way of actually increasing the revenue for uh, these telecoms who are often government-owned. But for other countries, uh, the reason for it is that some of these services are a bit harder to intercept. Uh, these 10 most common internet controls you can find on our website. But what I would really like to focus are three particular controls that we found to be uh, pervasive and particularly worrisome over the previous coverage period. So one of them is growing surveillance. The entire world has justifiably been focused on what is going on in the United States. But what we've seen in our research is that surveillance is actually part of a growing trend. So over the previous year, we found evidence that in 35 of the 60 countries that we examined, government has either obtained more sophisticated technology or increased the scope and number of people monitored, or it has passed a new law which uh, give, gives it greater authority to conduct surveillance. Uh, Russia, in particular, has uh, emerged as an incubator of surveillance technologies and legal practices emulated by other former Soviet republics. So what we've seen is that places such as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, and several others uh, have actually obtained similar surveillance technologies as what is found in Russia. Also, another finding was that uh, among our sample of 10 African countries, all of them, just over the past year alone, have stepped up their online monitoring um, activities. In part, this is because we've seen increased uh, internet penetration in most of the African countries. So many of them, at this point, are just catching up. And then part of it is that many of these surveillance technologies are now available on the market so easily that the government uh, can uh, obtain them without much, uh, pro many problems. Uh, the Middle East and North Africa is a region where surveillance uh, has been pervasive for a number of years, and we've seen many governments actually strengthening their efforts. So for example, in Saudi Arabia, we've seen the government proactively recruiting experts to work on intercepting encrypted data. The second area that I would like to highlight are new laws uh, to restrict online speech. And uh, this is a really important area because until a few years ago, very few countries had laws that specifically regulated or dealt with ICTs. And this is starting to change dramatically. So we've seen a pro 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 proliferation of laws uh, that deal with internet use. And many of these laws are extremely restrictive. Over the past year alone, uh, in 24 out of 60 countries that we examined, we saw the passage of at least one law that negatively impacts internet freedom. Uh, one interesting thing is that many of these restrictive laws are often disguised as cybersecurity or anti-terrorism legislation but they also contain vague language used to criminalize legitimate speech and imprison activists. So I'll give you one example from the United Arab Emirates. In the UAE, a new cybercrime legislation passed last year uh, deals with some serious threats, such as money laundering, online crime, and so forth. But then the same law has particular provisions uh, that prohibits criticism online uh, of the ruling regime. In fact, it stipulates a sentence of up to life imprisonment for anyone who calls for regime change uh, through online co communications. We've also seen restrictive laws in Ethiopia, for example, 
And uh, the new law there actually places even stricter uh, penalties and regulation of the, on the use of voice over IP. And uh, it extends uh, the anti-terrorism legislation that it already exists to the online sphere. And this is particularly worrisome in a country like Ethiopia, where, we, where we've seen just last year a blogger and online journalist being sentenced to 18 years in prison for his criticism of uh, the government activities. We've also seen laws aimed at limiting information that is so-called extremist or blasphemous uh, being used to censor. So it is very important to actually look at these laws which on the surface uh, look like they're dealing with some of the uh, more important and harmful content. Uh, it is very important to really see whether they contain any provisions uh, that can uh, limit political speech. We've also seen new laws specifically aimed at controlling online media. And uh, this is important because in many of the authoritarian states, it's the online media where people can turn to uh, to look for independent sources of information. Um, so it appears that the authorities are taking notice of this. So there are more and more uh, trying to find ways to actually place greater controls on online media. One example is Jordan, for example, where the government last year passed a law that uh, regulates to much more extent uh, online news sources. And this new law uh, posts new registration requirements on online media, and it actually has also a requirement and, uh, uh, that holds uh, editors, editors and chiefs uh, responsible for everything that is posted uh, through these online news media outlets, including user comments. Um, the government had actually given a period of about 10 to 12 months for these online news media outlets to register, and then the outlets that did not register were actually blocked just a couple of uh, months ago. As a result of uh, many of these new laws, we are seeing more and more users being arrested for the things that they post online. So in 28 of the 60 countries that we assessed, uh, we found a user, at least one, arrested or imprisoned for posting political, social, or religious content online. And as I mentioned previously, what's really interesting is that uh, unlike in the past where it was mainly activists who would really promote democracy and human rights were the ones who are targeted, uh, now with the proliferation of social media, it seems like everyone is being affected. So in 26 countries, uh, it was actually social media users uh, who found police knocking on their doors. Uh, among a few of the interesting examples is one from India, for example, where a woman was um, complaining about traffic and service disruptions in Mumbai after the death of a prominent political dignitary. And uh, she was arrested just for posting uh, this comment on Facebook. And then her friend who liked this Facebook comment was arrested as well. Of course, after a public outcry uh, several days later, uh, they were both released. But this really showcases the type of threats uh, that online uh, users face nowadays. In fact, in India, according to our research, at least 11 social media users were arrested uh, uh, during the coverage period uh, for this report. In Ethiopia, we've also seen uh, such cases. For example, a student was arrested for criticizing rampant corrupt corruption at local university. And then at least 10 users were arrested in Bahrain for quote unquote in insulting the king on Twitter. We're also seeing a speech that might offend religious sensitivities is landing uh, a growing number of users in jail, as well as, as uh, humor and satire. And that kind of brings me back to my uh, introductory joke. Uh, just a few years ago, uh, it would have been almost funny to say that you could go to prison for a joke that, that you posted online. But we are really seeing that in more and more countries. Uh, I will give you one recent example from Turkey. Uh, a prominent composer posted on Twitter a joke saying something along the lines, do you know why a call for prayer lasts only 22 seconds? Kind of implying that it was because the relig religious authorities need to go back to their drinking and mistresses. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He was arrested. Um, I will show you here a, a cartoon from India uh, of a cartoonist who posted this along with a series of other cartoons. And uh, he also uh, was arrested 
although later he was uh, released. Although the picture seems quite grim at the moment, uh, I also want to highlight that we are seeing more and more uh, civil society activists and businesses and people from the technical community trying to push back uh, and resist against some of these uh, quite negative practices and legislative proposals. Uh, although this pushback is much smaller than just the number of attempts by governments to control the internet, it's extremely important to acknowledge it because we've seen that it has started to yield results. So in 11 countries that we evaluated over the past year, we saw a negative law being deterred or positive law being passed as a result of civic mobilization and, and pressure by activists, tech companies, international community, and so on. One example comes from the Philippines where the Cybercrime Prevention Act was suspended by the Supreme Court uh, after uh, over a dozen petitions were filed by citizens and lawyers. And in Kyrgyzstan, for example, the law on protection of children, which was similar to uh, quite uh, worrisome law in Russia, was also shelved because of civic activism. In Mexico, a very interesting example where a coalition of NGOs earlier this year came together and they were able to actually push the government to pass a new constitutional amendment which now guarantees freedom of access uh, to the internet. Although right now in Mexico, the government has not passed any secondary legislation to really specify how this new right would play out in practice, uh, it is a very important victory for civil society. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, thinking that actually a constitutional amendment uh, was uh, able to come to light is something that uh, is viewed as extremely positive. Uh, so I really want to uh, send a message here that uh, we are seeing these threats becoming stronger and stronger, but then at the same time, uh, there is this critical movement of activists who are trying to push back. And uh, it is very important to actually support this growing mo movement because most of the countries as we speak are looking into passage of new laws to regulate the internet. And uh, a few years from now, it might be too late because these laws and negative practices might be in place. But right now, while they're still being considered, this is just a critical time and space to try to shape those discussions and really bring about positive change. So I'm going to stop here, and uh, we're going to start a discussion. But I will turn the mic briefly to uh, my colleague, Gigi. Great. Thank you very much, Sonia, especially for ending on a, a somewhat positive note. So perhaps that's going to frame our discussion in a, a forward-looking way about uh, how we can combat those restrictions. We're, we're now going to basically open up a conversation among our panelists, but this is a, a conversation that the audience is invited to join in. So we're going to think about the presentation that Sonia just made and try to move forward with getting a better sense of the different key issues that are affecting internet freedom in the countries that are represented here and covered in the report. And then we want to also do what Sonia just highlighted for us and get more information about various in-country stakeholders who have tackled these issues. What's worked? What are you currently trying? And uh, what are some ways that we can have uh, an exchange of ideas? And then we also want to tease out what kind of efforts have yielded results. So not only what is currently being tried, but then what, what has actually worked. One of the goals will be to try to figure out how to best respond to the various types of threats to internet freedom on a global level since we're here at the IGF. We want to look at that, that international um, sharing. Okay, and just one more note about remote participation. Uh, of course, we have the, the IGF website for that, but then also if you're following along on Twitter, if you uh, post any questions using the hashtag SOTN2013, we have a, uh, a Twitter moderator who will capture those questions and make sure that the, the panelists address those. So again, the, the panel themselves will start to ask each other questions, but then definitely uh, we invite the audience to do so as well. We'll have microphones going around. Just raise your hand and one of the, the uh, runners will bring you a, a microphone. So um, turning to our panel, let's uh, kick off with some questions. Excellent. Well, my first question will go to Buzian from uh, Morocco. 
And it seems like that the government of Morocco in recent weeks and recent days has really stepped up its censorship efforts. So could you tell us a little bit more what's going on? Because it seems like a lot of people, a lot of delegates here at the IGF are hearing secondhand accounts and would like to know more. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, um, well, I'll just get, get to the facts first. On September 17th, a journalist and um, the director of an Arabic online um, news website was arrested and the charges were on terrorism related charges. He posted a link to a video by a terrorist group. It's nothing unusual for a journalist to do, which is to inform the public about an imminent threat. And he's, he's now spending time, he's now in jail and, and in a jail where convicted terrorists are actually detained. And um, what also happened in the past few weeks is also for the, for the first time in the past four, four years at least, where the two websites are, are being blocked. The, the website of this journalist, uh, lacum.com, the Arabic version and the French version. You can't access these websites from Morocco. Now, if, if you read the, the report um, I co-authored um, for Morocco, um, obstacle to access control on content, the first two main um, components of the report, Morocco really was fine because there was no blocking um, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, to access or content, um, what what uh, the pattern that uh, you know in terms of threat to in, to, uh, um, to internet freedom of cyber attacks, imprisonments of journalists, and we're looking at this pattern that is growing um, of arresting arresting online activists, but not charging them um, using laws that talk, using articles in the law that talk, for example, about freedom of expression, they would arrest them during street demonstrations and, and, and charge them with disruption of public order, um, uh, insulting a police officer, and they jail them. And really jailing these, these, these online activists is over their online activism, but the, the state has learned that using um, charges like drug-related, disruption of public order will keep these guys from the radars of international human rights organizations. And this is a pattern that we see happening in many of these uh, oppressive, non-democratic developing countries. Um, so it's really a scary moment right now in Morocco, I mean, just in the past few weeks. Absolutely. See, one thing that we've noticed in our research is that some governments actually don't block much information. Uh, they either don't block any websites or they block only a few, but uh, they actually instead prefer to go after people who post things online. And it's almost uh, a conscious tactic. It's, uh, it's, it, it's almost a policy uh, from the perspective that if uh, you can claim that you have free internet, if you know, they can say, well, look, uh, nothing is really blocked in our country. The internet is free. It's just that behind the closed door, then they go after and either attack people who post online or they imprison them. So uh, it, it reminds me of a saying that we had in the former Yugoslavia where you know, they can say that there is freedom of speech, but there was no freedom after speech. <laughs> so uh, let me go to Migat, and uh, if you could just tell us a, a little bit about some of the key uh, threats to internet freedom in your country. Uh, thank you, uh, Sanya. Um, just to, um, um, I mean, I, I recall that last year when I was on the same panel, I was talking about the YouTube blocking in Pakistan, and uh, Google representative was here, and I posed a couple of questions to him. Uh, and just to update you guys that the YouTube is still blocked in Pakistan. Uh, but, um, uh, I mean, uh, civil society organizations and internet rights activists, uh, they have now found few ways how to reach out to the government, how to raise awareness around the blocking and censorship, and how to uh, educate government and authorities that, you know, internet freedom is also, you know, comes into human rights. Um, so just, uh, um, uh, it's interesting to note that the day when Freedom House uh, uh, launched its report on freedom on the net, the same day our government um, announced the blocking of 
Skype, uh, Viber, and WhatsApp uh, for three months uh, in the name of national security. So um, it says a lot about the um, government's uh, um, attempts to block these communication uh, ways. Um, in Pakistan, we have seen that the past year, uh, the surveillance attempts has been made a lot. Also, the censorship and blocking of websites, social media networks, and also the mobile uh, communication has been shut down on every special occasion. Uh, but um, uh, but now uh, we have seen lots of efforts coming up from the civil society. Uh, for instance, one civil society filed a petition against this YouTube blog in the high court and uh, asked the government that, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, they filed the petition under the fundamental rights of access to information and freedom of expression. And, the, uh, and I'm so glad that high court didn't pass any order and they actually asked the other civil society to be amicus. On this uh, uh, on this lawsuit and to educate the judiciary that how we sort of tackle the issue. So um, we have we have seen these attempts by the government and also the efforts of the civil society in Pakistan. So uh, the case is still pending in Pakistan for the last many months, but uh, we hope that you know it uh, it will be unlocked soon. Thank you very much. So. Uh, here we can also hear from the host country from Indonesia about some of the key issues that, uh, that we're f seeing and facing here when it comes to internet freedom. First of all, I should thanks to Freedom House to invite us to also represent uh, the situation of the host countries. Although I noticed that in the chart of countries that you put on your presentation, Indonesia was not there for 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 for, for those who it is it is it is okay, okay. <laughs> so it's no mistake. Then uh, in regard to the threat against the internet freedoms, we notice that some of the factor has been mentioned in the presentations, like it, the search first is about the lack of law, which is. Uh, strongly protected the right of the people in terms of the internet freedoms. And it comes from either uh, the tendency that more and more regulation were actually becoming and put more provisions to control the content that can be posted, transmitted, or downloaded from the internet, as well as that justify the, we call it illegal, or at least unprocedural wiretaping practices. We notice like in the case of Indonesia, now there are 16 legal provisions existing and effectively operating in the countries that give several different agencies of the government to do a wiretapping without any proper procedures like warrant from the court, uh, guarantee the remedy of the victim in case there is any uh, misconduct or abuse of those provisions. Uh, some of them are highlighted in the report like in the case of counterterrorism policy, but Many others were not actually directed to that issues, but it's operating legally. Twelve out of the 16 are in the form of laws, so actually it can be challenged before the Constitutional Court in the countries. We managed to challenge one law so that uh, it strengthened the standard that any practices of tapping need to be based on law. The delicate issue will be what kind of conditions and what kind of the limitations that enable the government agency to do that practices. Another threat actually also raised by the uh, survey conducted by the uh, Freedom House, which is the over criminalizations or against individuals that try to raise their issues and concern through the internet. And in the case of Indonesia, we see more and more cases were actually reported in which formerly uh, the tendency is against the right defenders, but nowadays more and more cases are actually on the individual basis, like the consumer and the, and the business sectors uh, in the allegations that uh, or using under the pretext of defamations of the reputations of the companies. We saw many cases on this. One case would be a good example on how civil society and individuals, as well as the internet user, trying to consolidate the effort to fight back against this. Uh, the case is a Prita case, is a, a, 
a housewife that tried to complain about the services from the international hospitals that suffer below the standard and can be considered as malpractices of the medical services. And then she suffered from both uh, at one time the allegations of defamation with the criminal sanctions up to five years imprisonment and also a high fines, you know, because of this circulations of the email among his college. And then because of this, uh, this is also the, the first example in which NGO can work hand in hand with individual internet users as well as others, try to fight back the allegations and put, the, put this case into the issues of justice. Because the third aspect that we also notice from the ground is that is not probably is not explored in, 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 in the survey is the lack of or the not well functioning of rule of law, especially targeting that uh, the, the court is is not proper to handle this case. I mean, the internet, uh, the the you know the case of defamations related to the internet uh, users is new in Indonesia, and the legal proceedings to certain extent may not be appropriate. I mean, because we use the long panel code which is, has, hasn't been you know, able to be reformed up to the present. It's uh, the inheritance from the Dutch system. So uh, anybody can actually suffer both from the new law that give a harsh imprisonment sanctions in the case of defamation, as well as the application of the long panel code, I mean the previous panel code we inherited from the Dutch. And because of that, uh, usually individuals and more and more cases were reported actually, uh, the causes also relate to the fact that the clause, the defamation clause is very weak to be divine. And there is no standard, let, let's say the test standard that we recognize in the different regions in which one case actually can be a strong case of defamation. In here, if anybody feel that his uh, dignity were actually uh, destroyed by one other individual's action, they can come to the court and file the case both through the panel court and through the civil actions that saying that uh, it is justified because I suffer from those actions and my dignity is actually in, you know, destroyed by this some sort of like action. And without, with, with lack of capacity from the court themselves, I mean like the prosecutors and the judges, those become a new trend in which the criminal sanction is becoming a repercussion to other individual if one said that my reputation is in danger because of this without no sounds, you know, evidentiary standard in trying to go to that cases. That's what I can Let me ask you a quick question then, uh, relevant to Indonesia. So uh, when we conducted our research, uh, it was apparent that in Indonesia, thousands of websites regarding uh, related to pornography, violent extremism, uh, or even circumvention tools were blocked in Indonesia. So uh, I'm curious about your experience. Uh, is there much in terms of overblocking? So, uh, by mistake, let's say ISPs end up blocking some political or socially relevant material. Yeah. And if yes, could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, this actually includes uh, two recent cases in which uh, the website from the uh, some of the right defenders that are working on the LGBT issues were blocked arbitrarily by the ISP because of the keyword you know, like uh, the blocking practices or filtering practices is actually done by the third party. It's not by directly by the government. Uh, and then they use the, the same, key, the certain keyword. So any kind of website, basically in the case of LGBTI is the yoga and the Our Voice website that try to introduce the ideas of what is this, you know, the sexual right, this and that. But because of the word, and then they've been blocked because the word is considered in the keyword. The very issue with that is first, there isn't any standing obligations that justify those practices. Secondly, those kind of like practices, because it's done by the third party, it's 
substantially, you know, uh, in breach of the human rights standard as mentioned in many human uh, UN documents about how to limit the freedom of expression, including in the internet. And the third is there hasn't been any proper provisions that guarantee if I am the victims of those practices, what kind of reparations or remedies that I can go for. And in this case, it's just that, I mean, that with the support of human, other human rights defenders and NGOs, we try to go to the ministries of information and then try to ask them to uplift the blog. And it, it's done. But of course, the practices is still ongoing. I mean, there hasn't been any sign that the government tried to stop that because of the, under the pretext of protecting the morality of the society. Especially when it comes, and we also notice that there is a double standard because we saw some of the right wing, for example, conservatives uh, from the certain religions keep continuously posting uh, material on the net, which is actually, from our perspective, can be considered as an incitement or hate speech against other religions. And they've never been blocked up to now. Uh, I mean, you can see when it comes to the, uh, you know, like, I should mention, like, Foils of Islam, it, it's a web that really, if I'm a common people and then I, I, I go to their website, it actually can be considered as an incitement or hate speech to other religions among the Islam community itself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they've never been blocked up to now, and there are many, many, website in those, you know, uh, type that is now existing in Indonesia, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, so Ross here is from Google, and often when we talk about internet censorship, we focus on the fact that such censorship has on political activists or internet users more broadly. But uh, Ross, could you tell us what kind of effect does restrictive internet freedom environment has on uh, the business community and on tech companies such as Google? Um, sure. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, thank you for allowing me to be on the panel. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to to speak with you and, and with all of you. Um, I think the the way that we look at censorship and, and surveillance and issues like that, uh, we look at it through the prism of of our users, really. And how is uh, the censorship and, and the filtering affecting our user experience, first and foremost? Because we're a company that very much believes in putting our users first, and if you do that, then everything else is going to follow. You're going to be successful. And, uh, and so that's the first thing we think of when we see these things. We also um, look at it from the perspective of, of a business. And when we decide to enter a new market, for example, whether or not we're going to launch our products in a new market, uh, take Vietnam, for example, which has been the subject of many conversations, um, what sort of, what are we subjecting ourselves, our products, and our users to in that market? So when you take a, an environment like Vietnam, where we have a pretty um, clear sense that uh, things would be difficult for us, a lot of requests from the government to block uh, information or provide uh, data for users, um, which we don't do, uh, at the same time, uh, we do take, a, take that into account. Like, why, why would we go into Vietnam if we're going to be constantly subjected to these sorts of government requests that we're not going to comply with? And then you kind of look down the road and get a sense of what, what, what life is going to be like there. But we have to, we have to also counterbalance that with what our real mission is, which to, is to get our products to as many users as possible in the world and to uh, provide access to the net, really, to as many uh, users as we can around the world. So those are, those are some of the things we, we think about when we, when we think about filtering and censorship. Okay, so then more generally, what role uh, do you think uh, should the private sector play in ensuring free and open access to the internet? I, th I think it should be playing uh, a very large role and certainly a larger role than it is. We, we have to be smart about how we do this, of course. Um, one of the reasons we fund civil society and NGOs all around the world is because we recognize that in many parts of the world, 
those are the voices that are going to be most effective in this fight. You know, we're, we're very conscious of the fact that my going into a government meeting and demanding free and open access to the net can often be uh, a counterproductive way of spending our time. Um, so we do a lot of work to find and fund and enable uh, users around the world to, to be those advocates because those voices are very important. We do recognize, however, that in other parts of the world, and particularly in Southeast Asia, where there's a particular emphasis right now on economic development, that Google can uh, be a very powerful voice. And we usually meet with those governments when we're talking about uh, open access to information, uh, and we approach it from an economic development argument. Um, that it's not, uh, uh, many governments feel like, okay, just give me the net, give me access to the web, and everything is going to be fine. And you have to explain to them that that's not really true. That what they're seeking is sort of, you know, economic development. But you need a free and open web in order for that to happen because it's the free and open access to information uh, which allows for the innovation and the creativity and the entrepreneurship which in turn leads to the economic development that, that everyone is seeking. So when we go in and make those arguments in certain parts of the world, that can be really powerful. I think what, what industry needs to do, however, is recognize that an even more powerful argument is when all of business and all of industry goes and makes those arguments. It's one thing for Google to do that, but the reality today is that pretty much every business is, to some extent, an internet business. Say you're a car company. The reality is today that you can't reach new customers. You can't source raw materials. Your employees probably can't even communicate with each other uh, without using the internet. So every business is an internet business. And yet when we see things like cross-border, you know, blocking cross-border data flows or filtering or censorship, we don't see enough companies who are not typical internet companies come to that fight. And that's something that uh, Google is trying to work on to get more partners in the, in the, in, in the business world to engage in this because uh, it really does affect everyone. Um, and we're starting to see more engagement on this, particularly in the world of trade agreements, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and both bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. But we really would love to see more, more industry engaged in the battle all around the world. So speaking specifically of trade agreements, what are uh, examples of provisions that can be entered to really strengthen uh, that free flow of information uh, within that context? Well, I, I think you can look at things like just provisions about the free flow of information and data across borders. You can look at issues like, uh, you know, forced localization of data, which is something that we uh, are currently discussing with the government of Indonesia and many other places around the world, Brazil most, most recently. And we think that that's a very dangerous proposition. Um, you know, I think trade and trade agreements is, is an area where industry, uh, particularly technology companies, really need to engage more. The reality is that we are, are relatively new to that space. We've let a lot of um, uh, what I would say, not not to be uh, you know, uh, not to speak ill of them, but sort of older economy type of industries play in that space, like manufacturing, where the focus is on tariffs and and issues you know and issues like that. But when you look at what's driving much of the economy in the world right now, it's this knowledge-based economy and the internet enterprises. And uh, we're just now engaging uh, um, in a very real way on that issue. And, uh, and as, as we continue to do that, I think we're going to see uh, really uh, vast improvements in, in, in how those agreements are used to advance free expression and free and open internet. That's my hope, anyway. All right. Speaking specifically about data localization, we've seen that emerge as a problem uh, over the last few years. In fact, more and more countries are trying to uh, impose uh, data localization restrictions. So Russ, could you then speak uh, just uh, very briefly about uh, what do you say to those governments from your pers perspective? Why is that bad? Well, I, 
I honestly think that a lot of governments don't really have a clear sense of how the internet works uh, when they when they call for things like data localization. They think that okay, just just um, keep all that data here in this country, and then I'm, we're going to have jurisdiction over it, and that means that you're going to have to give us what we want. And the reality, as all of you know, is that the internet really doesn't work that way. I mean, a single email, a single Gmail, uh, could be divided into any number of different pieces and parts, and they're located at different data centers all around the world. It's just the way the net works. And we think that that's a good thing because it makes it more secure, and it really, you know, to be honest, it, it doesn't subject that communication to, uh, you know, we would argue various jurisdictions. So there's a sense that somehow a country can, okay, every piece of data is going to stay right in here, and that, that way we're going to have access to it. And it just, it just doesn't work that way. The arguments that seem to work best um, really revolve around explaining how the internet works and how industry, you know, is, is just simply not going to be able to do this. Um, the, to be honest, the, the issue is a harder one when you have a larger market like Brazil, where uh, companies are going to want to be in Brazil and they're going to want to participate in that market. And if Brazil were to sort of enact a data localization requirement, that would be a really hard battle. In smaller countries, when when you know when you when they're starting to consider data lo localization laws, you can make the very valid argument that what you're really doing, uh, country X, is you're cutting yourself off from the internet. That that it sends a very clear signal to business that that um, that this is a that this is a place where you have to think very long and hard about whether you want to be accessing that market at all. And that's not it's not the sort of direction that most countries that care about economic development want to go in. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is very helpful. Uh, what I would like to do next is uh, I would like to focus on a couple of things that were said during the panel and uh, which specifically deal with uh, activism and as well as the role of courts in um, overturning some of the bad or negative laws that we've seen being passed in uh, countries under study. Uh, Nigat mentioned, uh, for example, that the YouTube uh, block is currently being uh, uh, looked at by the courts, and at least there was a petition to the courts to look into the matter. And Indri also mentioned uh, some efforts uh, regarding surveillance in Indonesia to that extent as well. So uh, Nigat, could you actually tell us a little bit more about those efforts, and do you really see the courts as stepping in and being the protector of internet freedom in Pakistan? I think that's a very interesting question because uh, um, in 2010, it was actually our high court who um, ordered to block Facebook because of the blasphemous content. And uh, it set a very bad precedent of blocking social media networks, uh, the ad hoc blocking of social media networks in Pakistan. Uh, but um, now I have seen the trend uh, is now changing slowly and gradually. After this YouTube petition, uh, it was very good to see that uh, judge didn't decide himself anything about the YouTube case, but he actually invited um, different um, amicus to assist him on the case. Uh, 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 by the way, one amicus is here in the audience, and uh, she can uh, um, tell more about the efforts they are doing in terms of, you know, doing advocacy and campaigning. Uh, one another representative from the organizations who who have actually filed the case in the Lahore High Court. So it would it would be good to hear from them that how they are educating the judiciary and how they are raising the awareness about the internet freedom in Pakistan. So um, it would be good to hear from the audience as well. Fantastic. Well, this is the right time then to ask the audience. Uh, is uh, the gentleman that Miga just mentioned, is, is he here? Would he like to uh, share a few words? Oh, Senna is here. Okay. Um, would you mind sharing a few words about the efforts? That's an excellent way of diverting the question. I'm going to try that the next time. Um, well, actually, just to put everything on record, my organization was uh, was uh, nominated to send a, uh, an amicus, and my colleague is the amicus on the case, not me. But I can surely speak uh, on behalf of the organization what we're doing. Uh, it's certainly very interesting, and um, 
we were we have been as part of our policy advocacy campaign have been meeting uh, judges as well as legislators as well as regulators uh, talking with them about the different issues that are being faced by uh, netizens in Pakistan and how these different stakeholders play a role in sort of worsening the situation and as a part of that we have had prior meetings with these judges uh, before this uh, not anticipating any cases but just the fact that the whole high court um, just to just for the record is also the court that ordered for the blockage of the Facebook ban and therefore it's not it's not does not have a very good reputation and we met with three judges one of them was the one who later on took up the um, YouTube case so he was aware of the work that we were doing and he was also aware of the fact that uh, we had uh, very politely conveyed that the judiciary does not seem to be very tech savvy Ross also mentioned about you know, most government officials not being very tech savvy and the role that we've been playing as an Americas is to provide um, the court with as many resources as we can and to steer the debate away from the unfortunate video to the larger context of what YouTube or Google uh, is you know as a platform and how people are using that for for different uh, different things one of the campaign that we've done is a, is both a public campaign as well as a cam campaign with the court and that includes sending citizen letters to the judge and when the, when the case started, the judge began with saying, this video needs to be blocked, and let's move on with saying, how do we block it? And we were really, really, really anxious at that point, because that meant that they would want localization, they would want to hold Google accountable, which unfortunately would mean uh, much more sort of a tussle between Google and government, and we'd suffer between the two. Um, and also would mean uh, also, you know, a, a, a passageway for the URL filtration system. From that, in three months, we've moved to the judge saying that if we buy a technology and that does not ensure 100% blockage of all kinds of content, why waste money anyway? And it's, it's happened not only because of the work that we're doing, but also the diverse voices that have come into the debate that has allowed the judge to say it's not about the video it's about this driver who's written me a letter saying he can't read English but and he's stuck at his employers all day and his only resource to normal fear his only resource to daily life is just watching the live stream of news channels via YouTube or this artist who's, who's deaf and is one of the most brilliant photographers that we have in Pakistan who learned uh, you know to communicate through technology so yeah just you know at this point uh, the judge has referred the case to a larger bench which we feel would be a much much better way to approach it because if a larger bench gives any decisions um, it, it would be legitimized much more it would be hard to challenge it because there's also a parallel case in the Peshawar High Court we don't want to talk about where that's going um, so hoping that you know things get better and that's the summary of what's happening with the YouTube case yeah Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, also speaking about judicial uh, decisions, what we've seen in the Philippines, the, exa the example that I cited earlier, is that uh, as part of the civil society campaign, different petitions were filed with their Supreme Court, which in the end decided to suspend the law. So it seems like in the countries where there is uh, at least some level of judicial independence where those channels are available, the courts are definitely at disposal. However, it really becomes problematic in countries where uh, judiciary is not independent at all and uh, activists just cannot turn to that and they have to turn to other methods. Uh, we do have full house here in the audience and I wonder whether anyone uh, would be willing to share a successful example or successful campaign from their country uh, which was able to either overturn uh, a particular law or deter it or something that you really feel like made a difference uh, where you live. Uh, okay, we can hear from Mexico. I want to share my name is Jorge Vizierra from Mexico, part of the Freedom House delegation. I want to share the experience of civil society organizations that were able to put together a bill to the Congress uh, in order to modify the Constitution and get the access, the free access to the Internet a uh, constitutional right. That's important for two reasons. One is that in the past only the executive power and the Congress uh, could submit 
bills to the to the Congress, but now the Constitution was modified in order for the civil society organizations or, or any citizen can send a, a, a bill, a proposal to the to the Congress, and then to see what can happen. And this experience was uh, successful. And the second reason why this is uh, important it is because this is the first time in Mexico's history that a constitution has been modified by um, by a proposal uh, coming out from the civil society. So then just to follow up, uh, Jorge, regarding Mexico, let me ask you another question so you should keep the mic. Uh, so what would you say was the uh, key uh, component of su success. So, of course, you mentioned uh, part of it is that now civil society is able to propose legislation directly, but uh, I would think that there are many proposals out there. So, uh, what specifically do you think made this such a huge success? What made it, you know, resonate with politicians and other stakeholders to the point that they were able to embed this as part of the Constitution? Well, first of all, because they have to, they have to have about 25,000 signatures of support from citizens in order to to send a bill to to the Congress. So they were able to do that. So they have the capacity. But uh, the main point is that they have the willingness to join together and to work together in order to get that success and that's important. In Mexico, I think political pa parties are quite divided and there is a, a lot of political fractionalism and the, the initiative from civil society is showing the country that um, they can work together to, to improve the, the internet freedom in Mexico, that's a huge um, success. Thank you. And it seems like we have one more comment here, uh, Jorge, right in front of you. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I'm also coming from Mexico. I, I work in the foreign ministry. Just wanted to add something on, on what Jorge just said. Uh, it's true that it was a victory of civil society, but at the end it's not just civil society. The whole country is gaining from a very interesting reform because uh, the plan is to get a secondary law that will enable us to have connectivity uh, for more than 90% of the population in a very near term. And uh, it's uh, it really, it was a very open dialogue and uh, it was something that has been on the table for a few years. And finally, I think society-wise, uh, people realize that it's a very positive thing we're going to have indigenous commun communities connected. And, and this is in line with the new models of technology because the, the mobile phones are going to be accessible very soon for everybody. So for us, this empowers society, something very positive. And the, the real uh, secret of this also is that we were uh, under using our connectivity with the, elect um, the electric line of the country has fiber optic and it was not used. So now with uh, the fiber optic plus connectivity through the mobile phones, I think we will have very soon most of the, of the country connected. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sir, if you can actually keep the microphone, I'd like to ask a, a follow-up question. Jorge Luis, can you pass it back to the minister? I, I wanted to ask, uh, I think, this, uh, you know, strikes me as a very positive development and perhaps a question then on everybody's mind is, uh, is the government thinking about any measures to take to ensure the, the safety of the population online? As you know, there are many non-state actors that are perpetrating a lot of um, digital violence and offline violence um, against citizen journalists and bloggers. And so, um, you know, what questions are you asking, and perhaps how can other stakeholders work with you to address those uh, those concerns of safety? Well, at the end, this is something new, and we're going to see how it, it evolves. But uh, civil society, I think, in Mexico, and Jorge can, can uh, comment on this, but has been more active, has been more engaged. And, and I think uh, connectivity uh, enhances communication and the more people is connected, also there will be uh, new ways to, to tackle these problems. 
No, so for us, this is uh, uh, really, I think the positive side is there. there. There's, of course, some things that we have to watch out in, in a society. We have to, to start uh, solving them. But uh, as a whole, as, as we said before, I think in Mexico, the society is very uh, happy of, of these new, new things um, taking place. Thanks. Luis, if you want to answer, and then I see Gina next to you. Yes, thank you for the comment. Um, there are two more um, developments in Mexico uh, which are so important. First of all, I think the, the, the law was modified in order to, for a federal, a federal officers can attract uh, any, any, uh, any aggression to a journalist as a federal crime. And that's very important. Um, um, in the past, any attack to a journalist, I mean, we have about 80 journalists killed in Mexico over the last uh, 10 years. But in the past, uh, it remained like a local issue for local authorities to investigate. But now, um, the federal government can attract the case and then and they can use the um, federal capability in order to investigate uh, more deeply the, the assassination or the murder of a journalist. And the second step is that um, the, the, uh, the the Congress and the executive power uh, managed to get uh, support and change the law in order to get a, a governmental mechanism to protect journalists and uh, human rights defenders. Right now, this is uh, of course the, that's a process. Uh, the, the, this, this, this commission needs, of course, more budget and more people training. But at least, I think this is our first step in the right direction. Thank you. I, you know, since Sonia did mention earlier the um, efforts in the Philippines, maybe we can hear from our, uh, I, I see someone next to you uh, who can speak to that effort, and then um, we can go around to the hands that I see up. Okay. Uh, hi, good, uh, good morning. My name is Judith Sunido. I'm from the Philippines and part of the Freedom of Delegation. Uh, aside from the uh, uh, injunction by the Supreme Court of the Cybercrime Bill, uh, a, group, a group of us had um, made the crowdsourced uh, legislation, which is basically the Magna Carta for Philippine Internet Freedom. And this was, uh, in the Philippines, usually lawmakers have their own staff do the laws. So what we did was we put a document online and crowdsource it, people came in. When it was uh, completed, we basically uh, went offline. So when we went to legislators to uh, lobby for the bill. Uh, actually, several legislators, and we found two or three champions now uh, in the Senate. And aside from that, we also went offline to the different communities affected. These were media people. Uh, other bloggers, other journalists, all, all around the country to get support for the bill. And what we found out is it was not only a, an effort to convince people that this was a good alternative, but also to stretch out a lot of issues in between uh, with the document and how it would affect them. And as such, the bill itself is a growing document to reflect how uh, what the what uh, people want uh, with, with their internet. Great, thank you very much. Okay, let's get some more stories. Uh, I see the hand up in the back, so if our microphone runner. Oh. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Sridhi Pranamaji. Uh, I'm a blogger, activist, and currently I'm associated with uh, ISOC Nepal chapter. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, I have relieved the consequences of uh, being a blogger uh, about uh, expressing my expression and, uh, you know, I was uh, attacked uh, for uh, publishing a report on CNN I report in 2011. I believe uh, there are limited factors uh, when we talk about uh, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, there is lack of policy at national level. Uh, though there are um, treaties, charters, 
But when it comes to national policies, it is not defined. Right? So there is a vacuum. I believe there is lack of awareness as well and lack of governance. I think bloggers and activists and microbloggers are more prone uh, to uh, the consequences of freedom of expression rather than journalists because uh, freedom exp because journalists are more protected by the organization as well as uh, their, uh, they have their own uh, feasible rights uh, because uh, they have federations to address them. One question that I have is, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, the we are talking about freedom of expression, but what about uh, the citizen, citizen uh, journalism websites that are hosting uh, these FOEs? Um, shouldn't they actually be accountable uh, in respect to defending the rights of bloggers and citizen journalism? Because at the end, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to reality, when, uh, when action happens, it happens to the bloggers and they are left behind with few press releases. That is a reality. And then action happens. But the websites uh, that the, the, through which they communicate, they are least bothered. They are least bothered. I'm telling you this. Uh, they probably take off their hands. So what about the accountability of the civil uh, journalism websites? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can get some uh, members of our audience to speak to that, some successful efforts to defend the rights of citizen journalists and bloggers. Uh, I saw a hand here. Hi, my name is Rishi Chaudhary. I'm a lawyer from India. And um, I had a question for Google, but what I wanted to now, of course, address also is the experience of India right now. Um, right now, there are five petitions pending in the Supreme Court of, in uh, Court of India, which uh, range from intermediary liability issues, which involve, of course, the usual suspects, and uh, also something which speaks to the free speech and expression rights of the users. Uh, in India, there have been a lot of arrests based on people's status updates on Facebook or tweets which they have sent out. And uh, the way free speech and expression is applied online is different because of uh, the Information Technology Act's provisions than it's an offline world, where India recognizes free speech as a fundamental right. Um, we are, we've been very hopeful about the Supreme Court because the track record of India Supreme Court on free speech issues is pretty good. However, um, in the last pr a few proceedings which we've been following, uh, I think Sana's point about that the judges aren't aware of how technology works is one. And uh, second, everything in India at least starts with a conversation about communal rights. Um, third, I think the companies aren't really helping. They are, they are mostly in the reactive modes. They um, answer litigation when they are dragged to court for one thing or the other. And they make distinctions like the holding company, which, for example, Google Incorporation, is not responsible for the action, is the one which is responsible and is the service provider for these services. And the Indian company, which is only the holding company, is uh, and a subsidiary of that, is not responsible for these actions. And uh, what I've observed, at least, the judges would come and say, well, we understand the technicality, but the uh, but the issue is that you are here, people are using your services here, and if this is the distinction you're going to try to hide behind, then arbiter, this is not, these are not the, nothing has been decided, but they have made just statements offhand from the bench, where they would say things like, so how does China do it? Which we from civil society read as that, uh, although India prides itself from distinguishing from these authoritarian regimes, but they are willing to at least are, are they trying to consider these other things and what is these companies, how are they going to assist us? Because uh, I understand it's not, uh, we, the civil society appreciates that the companies have no right or no mandate to protect free speech and expression of the various users, but the business model is such that they are bound to do that and now it has spilled over in this space. But all these arguments make us just wonder what is happening. But that's India's experience. There's nothing which has come out right now. Everything is in pendency stages. And hopefully things will come out in favor of free speech and not otherwise. Let me just ask you a very quick follow-up question. Uh, so in India, did you see much cooperation between civil society and the private sector to 
uh, deter some of these negative practices that we've been hearing about? I would say that at least there is a dialogue, but I do not know at least uh, what the litigation strategies are, and everybody is entitled to hold their litigation strategy as well as whatever they're going to do in courts pretty close to their heart. They can do that. There is definitely open dialogue. They talk. Google, I do not, under, I do not know, but uh, because I don't know what's happening there, but there is at least an opening dialogue. I won't say that they don't come out and talk, but we do not know how much is the collaboration on these issues. Uh, to talk about intermediary liability issues, where because the ultimate beneficiary are the citizens, but of course the companies need the safe harbor protection if they are going to operate and continue providing that platform. So, um, of course, that's where our interests align. So there is increased cooperation. But other issues, of course, things would be different. If you're going to be talking about privacy and surveillance, you're not going to be always on the same side. That's right. Well, let me then follow up with Ross quickly. Has Google been involved with civil society in India? And more generally, what kind of policy steps or advocacy has the company done? Um, uh, we, we have very much so. Um, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't catch your, your name, but... Um, Okay. Um, we, um, we are engaged in the litigation. Uh, that's absolutely true, but we're engaged in a much deeper level in conversations with civil society and with supporting that work. There's actually uh, an article in Outlook India that, that makes the claim that Google actually is too involved in Indian society and with the NGOs, and they, sh they should be less so, is one way to read the recent article, right? But, um, you know, correctly pointing out that intermediary liability is a, is a key issue in India right now in reform of the IT Act. So I, I actually take issue with your characterization that we're hiding behind these shell companies because in the absence of true intermediary liability protection, if we were to say, yes, we are fully an Indian company and we're completely subject to the law, that would be highly problematic. And as you noted, intermediary liability is a key issue to protect users and to protect free expression, and it's why we're so engaged on it. I think, I think it's, um, so I would, I would say that uh, it's not exactly uh, correct from my point of view that we are completely reactionary and being dragged to court. Um, we are actively engaged in litigation to try and address these issues, and we're also actively engaged in lobbying the government and supporting civil society to get these rules changed. Because I, I completely agree that our interests are 100% aligned on this. And maybe there are disagreements about specific strategies and, and approaches, but I think it's important to keep in mind the broader picture that both of our hearts are in the right place and we're all trying to go in the right direction. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you feel at least there's been a dialogue about that, even if it hasn't been 100% perfect. Thank you very much. It seems like we have several hands. And uh, Eduardo, I think you're next. And then we have several uh, hands over here and over there. Thank you. I'm Eduardo Bertoni. I'm a law professor in Argentina and also I am at the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at Palermo University in Buenos Aires. And I want to share what some experience in Argentina. It's very similar to what our colleague explained in, in, in India. Uh, one very big issue, not the only one, but one very big issue in, in Argentina is intermediary liability. There are more than 200 cases in the courts. The good news is that when those cases reach to the Supreme Court, the decision is pending. And why I'm saying that this is a good reason, because up to now, the, um, the opinion of the Attorney General is a good opinion uh, in favor of freedom of expression and for non liability of intermediaries. So. It's not an obligation of the, of the Supreme Court to follow the opinion of the Attorney General, but it's a good step forward. And what I want to highlight here is the importance of litigation in some countries as activities that can start changing the environment. At the same time, uh, many civil society organizations are following and pushing for the reform 
of the law itself because the problem is that I said that we have over almost 200 cases and the judges are deciding in very different ways and um, one reason is because they don't understand what internet is and the other is because the legislation is not clear enough to apply to this kind of situations. So this is the situation in, in, in Argentina. We have a, a question to for for us. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in another strategy. <laughs> One of the old strategies in the protection of human rights is what we call naming and shaming. So you name the violator, put in the spotlight, it's a shame, and that's it. I mean, it's a, a way to prevent violations, actually. I think that in some way, the, the Google Transparency Report has something to do with that strategy, okay? Uh, and I work on that kind of report. And I work on that after Google and new companies trying to do some similar reports. Uh, but, but my question is, does Google already finish some sort of assessment of the Google Transparency Report? Has it, the Google Transparency Report, did you think that it was useful to start stopping some sort of request for blocking or taking down? Or, I mean, I, I know that, you know, maybe you don't have the answer yet, but I think it would be interesting to know how the Global Transparency, uh, the Global Transparency Report is, is working. Because it will not be the same for some countries that in the past can, you know, send a lot of requests for, for the companies to take down content and nobody knows that. Now we know, and now we know that in Latin America, Brazil is one of the most, one of the countries that have more uh, requests for, 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 for blocking and this kind of thing. So that's my question. Thank you. So, Ross, I'm going to give you a chance to address that when we do wrap-up comments from the panel. Uh, if I can get the microphone up here in front, please. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, you know, we might cut about uh, two or three minutes into the, the lunch hour. Uh, so why don't we have five minutes for um, a couple more questions, and then we'll take five minutes for the panelists to address the various issues which have been raised, which uh, incredibly address kind of three, the three categories that the Freedom on the Net report uses to, to analyze. Um, the net freedom. So we'll we'll get to that. But okay. Rafael, I'm Rafael Marques from Angola, and I'm here as part of the Freedom House delegation. And I would just highlight um, a case that happened in Angola, but has been under the international radar. In 2011, the government tried to pass the National Assembly actually passed the first draft of a bill, uh, internet bill, and this bill essentially made it a crime for. Uh, individuals to post online without the consent of the parties mentioned in uh, their correspondence uh, or even pictures or those uh, involved in the pictures and exempted the state media and the public sector from uh, such law. Also, um, the same uh, draft law also made it a, a crime, uh, conferred discretionary powers uh, to the military and the police and the state security to search homes without warrants to seize that and related equipment including computers, hard drives, uh, cell phones on suspicions that these individuals might be engaged in defaming the authorities through the internet. So there was uh, an immediate reaction from society and this bill, uh, the approval of this bill has been halted. But because there isn't uh, an international recognition of what is happening, at any moment, because the ruling party has over 72% of the seats in parliament, uh, this bill can be made into a law at any time. And so what I bring to your attention is the need to just basically um, get to know a little bit of what is happening in Angola because if this bill is approved and made into law will be the most draconian one uh, in the world at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. So now here. So uh, sir in brown first and then next to you and then we'll go to the panel. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost brown, but you know. 
Yeah, brown stripes. Yeah. Um, I have a question for the for the gentleman from Morocco. Um, my name is Ludo Kaiser. I'm from the Netherlands. I work a lot in Eastern Amsterdam, Little Morocco, as they call it. Um, and I have a question when it comes to the the kissing incident, uh, the the picture. Uh, um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with it, but you know, uh, some young people posted a, a picture. Of that they gave a sweet kiss to each other and they got into a lot of trouble. Um, and actually, I want to I want to ask this question to you, but I guess it is similar in in many more cases and countries. Um, but the youth that I know, I work a lot with Moroccan youth in Holland, and um, they're scared. You know, uh, should they do something? Should they post uh, stuff to uh, on Facebook? But then they are very scared because every summer they go to Morocco. And you know, uh, same thing from the Ethiopian, I found an Ethiopian uh, youth organization, same thing when it comes to Ethiopians uh, in different circumstances, but I would, would like to direct this question to you. What is your advice for uh, immigrant youth in other countries that, you know, feel the need to do something but are very afraid that something will happen to them or their families if they step up? So what, what is your personal advice? Thank you so much. And very, very briefly, thank you. Ah, thank you for the insightful discussion. I'm a cyber world scholar from Japan. Uh, you said some country recently has a, a, have a abolished censorship of political speech, but these countries sometimes uh, arrest and punish uh, individuals who posted political speech on cyberspace. Uh, so. Some people say censorship and the prior restraint uh, more, uh, more dangerous than subsequent punishment to speech. So what do you think uh, difference uh, between censorship and uh, subsequent punishment in cyberspace uh, from a free speech perspective? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So if everyone will um, indulge me in five more minutes, I'm very sorry, we're going to have to uh, wrap up with questions from the audience because we are almost out of time. If we can have um, the panelists, I'm sorry, the, uh, can I get the microphone up in front now? Um, here, thanks. Uh, so we, we heard a lot from the audience about various kinds of, of uh, restrictions on the net. We heard about um, alleviating obstacles to access in Mexico. We heard about um, pushing back against control of content in the Philippines and other countries. We talked about violations of user rights in Nepal and other countries. Uh, Russ, specifically, we want to hear from you about the tactic of naming and shaming through the Google Transparency Report and a little bit about what um, users can do not only in the countries where uh, the repressive tactics are being practiced. So if you can each take one minute to address the, you know, the, the issue that you uh, kind of most spoke to you, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Um, thank you. Uh, for, first, I want to respond to uh, our colleague from Nepal who talked about um, internet policy. Uh, I mean, the, I'm an academic, so I always look at the literature. You know, it has been written about internet policy, and this is a normative um, take into this whole notion of, of, uh, of internet policy. Now we have print, we have broadcasting, and we have the internet. For print, it's like First Amendment, right? It has to be free, it's not pervasive. If you read something that's offensive to you, well, it's your problem, right? Because nobody shoved it, you know, on your throat. Broadcasting needs to be regulated for, because the nature of broadcasting is different. You need a license to use the airwaves. You have to regulate that because it's all technology. Number two, the technology is pervasive. You turn on the radio, you don't know what to expect. You're with your kids, you may hear something that's, you know, you know, obscene or whatever. So broadcasting, in, in the literature at least, it, it's agreed upon that it is an area that needs to be regulated. Now for the internet, the, the dominant argument in the literature right now is that it should be treated exactly like print should not be treated like broadcasting. What the states are trying to do, especially, I mean, and, and this includes every, basically, democratic and non-democratic states, they're using national security, child pornography, privacy, copyright, and they're using this argument to say, no, we have to regulate the, the internet in the same way that maybe broadcasting is regulated. And this is the fight I think we need to, to take on, is to try to protect this um, uh, you know the internet now in terms of um, 
what you can do as a blogger, I think you're in the right place. There are so many organizations, and Freedom House is one of them, uh, that really look after your interests. And I mean, at the level of Nepal, I think it's to organize, you know, just like the journalists are doing in many oppressive countries, they organize in associations, unions. I mean, why not the bloggers? I mean, if you have every right to, to organize to protect yourself. With the, the, I mean, just a very brief summary about the kissing instance. This is two kids uh, in front of high school who kissed. Uh, a friend of um, um, their friend took their picture, posted it on Facebook. All three of them were jailed. Um, and then they were released uh, a day after. My advice is that they should do more of that. They should not stop. Now, in Morocco, they should feel safe about this. Um, the, in Morocco, your, your life, your, your, you know, your um, livelihood is threatened if you are very politically active and you publish and you write in Arabic and you are targeting the king and you're very articulate about what you say and you have a lot of influence. I mean, that's when you start becoming in trouble. But for everything else, it's a wide margin of freedom and we should really explore that. Now, after those kids were detained, there was an uproar in the country, online and offline. Everybody was angry. Trust me on this, nobody will be arrested in Morocco over kissing pictures online because those kids had, had the courage to do that. And, and I think I would encourage other kids to, other, I'm, not, I'm not being, you know, not kids, but <laughs> anybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting old, you know, they're high school students. Um, so anybody really to take a chance and, and do things, to push, to push for, and I mean, uh, Ali Anuzla, who is the journalist now in jail, I mean, again, if we can get this guy released, I know the state will not arrest, you know, somebody like that, because we made them look bad, and we, can, we will continue to make them look bad. So I, I, I would tell everybody, take risks, the margin of freedom we have in Morocco, we have that because many people took risk, because many people went to jail over it, because many people, you know, uh, did things that they, they thought were crazy at the time, but because they did it, that's why, you know, I am here being able to say this freely, and, and, I, and I'm going back to Morocco, I don't live overseas, I, I'm going back and I know that I'm going to be fine. Well, I hope. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, First of all, I'm uh, really thankful to Freedom House that uh, they brought uh, activists, internet right activists from developing countries and gave us this platform to talk about the issues about our country and um, I mean we don't get this space within the country. So it's good to speak to the global audience and you know uh, let them know that what's going on within the country and also about the Freedom House report that it actually um, received a lot of media coverage in Pakistan and media houses reported this report um, and sort of pressurizing the government that you know the efforts they, the, uh, the the attempts they have been doing in censorship and blocking and filtration this needs, this needs to be stopped and um, um, I would uh, um, I would also request to the civil society organizations to join hands with each other within the country also not only outside the country and not only speaking on the panels and you know going out and talk about the issues but also within the countries join hands share information with each other because we see that as countries begin to increase uh, censorship and surveillance efforts we should actually join hands together to uh, uh, fight with these uh, attempts by the government thank you so much A very wise man, Mark Twain, once said, censorship is banning or forbidding a man to eat a steak because baby cannot chew it. And uh, a lot of these conversations that I've heard today really remind me of that. Governments wanting to uh, ban kissing because it might offend someone. Government banning cartoons because it might uh, offend uh, government officials. So I really want to uh, encourage different governments and different stakeholders here at the IGF to really look at policies and laws uh, that they currently have in place or that they're currently considering and really make sure that those policies are in line with international standards for human rights. Because only then and only then are we going to be able to have free and open internet. Thank you. And reflecting from Indonesian experience, I think a uh, few things that I can actually raise as the closing remark from us is we see a lot of examples 
one is I, the one that I presented, in which uh, new cases actually uh, encourage new strategies among the civil society. Like NGO used to work only among with NGOs, among their colleague NGOs, but not with these kind of cases, very specific cases in regard to the netizens. Then there is a new approach in which everybody can actually hand in hand. Uh, more and more people will actually come up and stand for the same, uh, you know, the same demand on the freedom of the internet, the freedom of expression in the internet, and it gives, uh, it makes a difference indeed. And and this is things that I actually feel it's very positive to be encouraged to go beyond only NGO, for example, and also uh, look forward for more you know, constructive engagement between CSO and business corporations, either the provider, the ISP, and so forth, because we actually, to a certain extent, uh, stand for the same, you know, demand in terms of the freedom of expression. And then the next is also because some of us were actually put forward the important rules of the court and the judiciaries, then one homework that I think is important is to ensure that those working behind the bar is really understand the standard. Because in many cases, like in the Southeast Asia country, especially, you know, in Indonesia, some of the problem relies on that. I mean, you know, the attorney general offices have no ideas about the standard of freedom of expression as well as the judges. So we'll, 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 give, we'll, we'll take that conversation yeah. off on anyone who wants to continue on, on that thought. We'll ask you to stick around uh, and just give Ross a minute to respond and we'll wrap it up. Great. I'll just quickly, I'll go quickly. I want to thank Eduardo for the question. As far as naming and shaming, I actually see something like freedom on the net is actually a more powerful tool in that regard than almost anything out there. I mean, there are lots of wonderful things about this report. Uh, the reality is even the visual of that map is a very powerful weapon for people to see what's going on around the world. But there's certainly a naming and shaming element to it as well. Sonia shared with me that she gets calls from governments, you know, lobbying her to make sure that they aren't listed as unfree or they want to be free instead of partly free. And that that's, that's power right there, really. Um, we're aware for our transparency report that there is a naming and shaming element to it, but I'd say the primary driver of it, Eduardo, is just the fact that there's, there's just simple power in that information itself. You can't really have a debate about these issues without knowing what the facts are and what the reality is. It's one of the reasons when the, the Chinese government, you know, wasn't ascribed particularly to the government, but when our systems were attacked, emanating from China that we went public when no other company would go public because you can't begin to address a problem unless you acknowledge that it exists and you have facts in which to have a, a real vigorous and robust debate about it. So that's, that's the reason we're doing the transparency report, why we've done it for the past three years. And we're also, I just want to say, working around and, and every release of the report, we make it more granular and, you know, more data. And we're working right now with NGOs all around the world for them to produce transparency reports. We were successful in Estonia. We were recently successful in Hong Kong. And we're working with about a dozen other countries, NGOs in those countries, to produce very local versions of those transparency reports to keep that debate going and, and to keep the debate informed by facts. Okay, well, without prior consent, I'm going to commit all the panelists to continuing this conversation with you over the next two and a half days. And uh, we do have some copies of the summary of the Freedom on the Net report if anyone is uh, eager to get their hands on those. Thank you all very much for uh, your indulging us in a little bit of extra time. Enjoy your lunch break and we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you.